Father God, Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I praise you and thank you for an opportunity to be here tonight, to be under your word. I thank you, Lord, that it is by the truth of your word that we get victory, that we get set free in our lives. We allow the Holy Spirit to teach this teaching further than my mere words now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. I'm so excited about teaching tonight. I'm going to teach about uh, standing firm in his righteousness. Now, you know that Pastor Jason and I, we live out pretty, pretty far out. If you just take Brown, Drive, <laughs> Brown Road and you hit a, a, a stop sign, yeah, that's where we're at. You take a left, you go all the way up. We're, we're really pretty much on the mountain. If you go out my front door... We're like a quarter mile and we can take a hike and we can go up all in, the, all in the mountain range up there. And when we first moved into this home, we went out there and um, there was no signs of where to hike. There was no like markers and there was four like different paths, but you know, without a marker, you don't know which way to go. And so as we were heading out, we just picked one of them and we headed out and we got so frustrated because we didn't have any markers. And I want to let you know tonight that God has prepared a clear pathway for you through Jesus, that you are the righteousness of God in him. Amen. And this is a clear, a clear pathway that the enemy, the accuser, likes to come to you, and he likes to accuse you, and he likes to throw you off that path. But God tonight is going to show you how clear this path is, and that it doesn't have to be messed up, that you can know that you are the righteousness of God in him. The day you got born again is the day you became righteous. And you can become no more righteous than that day. There's nothing that you can add to it, and there's nothing that you can subtract to it. You are the righteousness of God. But here's the problem. It's the enemy. It's the accuser. He tries to come and tell you where you have failed, where you have messed up. He comes to you and says, you're not worthy of that healing. You're not worthy of that wholeness and that healing. You're not worthy of love. He comes to us and, and says, you know, what have you been doing? Have you been praying enough? Have you fasted? Have you been in church? Have you been in your Bible? Have you, are you living a wholesome life? See, he, he comes at us and he tries to dig at you and dig at you to get your eyes on him and off of who Jesus is and what he accomplished on the cross for you. And so this is what I'm teaching today, that we are authorized to say that I'm not righteous because I've done everything right. I'm righteous because Jesus did everything right. Amen? His righteousness has been given to me, and I have been reconciled to God through Christ Jesus. That's, what's, that's what Jesus did for us. I am righteous in God's sight even when I fail. And this is how I like to say it. I like to say it like this. I have been established in his righteousness and I stand on his faithfulness. I, you know that you can stand on the faithfulness that Jesus faithfully went to the cross for you. Every sickness and every disease that he bore upon his back, every tormenting thing, every part of fear, confusion, any kind of things that are not of peace, he bore on the cross for you. It was a complete and finished work for you. Amen? And in that, you can stand on the faithfulness. When you don't have faith, you can say, that's okay, because I'm going to stand on Jesus' faith right now. And his faith is perfect, amen, and he will help you through that situation. Isaiah 54 and verse 14 says this, in righteousness, you shall be established. Listen to this. Isaiah, the prophet, wrote this. He was writing this about you. In righteousness, you shall be established. You shall be far from oppression, for you shall not fear. And from terror, for it shall not come near you. He talked about a day that when Jesus would come on this earth and he would take away all the sins of the world, he would establish you in his righteousness. And so these things like fear and terror and oppression, they can't come near you. They're not... A, 
supposed to or allowed to is a better word. They're not allowed to be a part of your life. When fear comes to you, terror, you're allowed to say to that fear and terror, excuse me, but I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You are supposed to be far from me. Oppression, you're supposed to be far from me because I am one with Jesus. Amen? You know, for something to be established, it takes time. Pastor Jason has been doing a teaching about, how does he say it? Little by little, we take, we're taking the promised land. We take these territories in our life little by little. And I, and I believe that this is the same thing with righteousness because it's just so hard for us to comprehend that we are in right standing with Father God. And the reason that is, is because of this word called sin consciousness. We are very sin conscious. We have been grown to know that if we do wrong, there shall be a punishment. We've grown our children. We've grown up as, wow, it just got bright on me right there. We, we've been children ourselves. We've done bad things and we've got the punishment, right? But God does not operate this way. God's kingdom, if I could say it this way, is a backwards kingdom. Jesus took all the punishment for you. The chastisement of peace, wait, how does it say it here? I want to say it the right way. Isaiah 53 and verse 5 says this. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement for our peace Say peace. Peace. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we were healed. That word chastisement is punishment. The punishment that he took on was for you to have peace in every single area of your life. That when you go to sleep, you have peace. When you rise, you have peace. When you go into that business meeting, you have peace. When you are raising your kids, you have peace. It is the peace that surpasses all understanding and you have it because of what Jesus did on the cross. We should memorize this scripture, Isaiah 53 and verse five. God's system is different. He's not Santa Claus. God is not Santa Claus. He's not looking around to make sure that you are good so he can be good. He just is good because you have Jesus. You receive Jesus. So we have to overcome sin consciousness. Now, not many of you know this about me. Um, I was born in Springfield, Ohio, and um, I was raised Catholic. And so from kindergarten to sixth grade, we moved to Arizona when I was going into seventh grade. So from kindergarten to sixth grade, I went to Catholic school. I was in the uniform and I had the nuns, you, you name it. I, everything you see in the movies, that was me. As a little girl, I was in a Catholic school. Once a week in Catholic school, you would have to go to mass. And when you go to mass, after the mass, you would line up for confessional. And I remember as a kindergartner and a first grader, second grader, lining up and literally saying, what did I do? I don't, I don't know what I did. Like, I don't know what I did wrong. So I, I just had to come up with things like, I'm so sorry I didn't put away my toys this week. I, you know, I had to come up with things, but understand this is what I lived under. What, what was being programmed in the inside of me was, I'm bad, I do bad things, and I need to pay for it. I had this consciousness on the inside of me. Now, when I was 10 years old, still living in Ohio, my mom and dad got born again. And they began to go to a church that was in in a little high school. And the Wednesday Bible studies were in my grandma's house. And my parents would go to this Bible study and they would come home because I was the babysitter of all the kids in the family. I didn't get to go to the Bible study in my grandma's house. They would come home and they would just be so happy and would have all these stories about the word that they heard. And I begged my mom and dad, can I go to that Bible study next week? And so they allowed me to come. So when I went, I got saved 
I received Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and I found out after I got saved that I could receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So I came the next week, and I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that's how I got saved when I was 10. Now, I'm still going to Catholic school. It wasn't until we moved here when I was going into seventh grade that the very first Sunday, my parents found Living Word Bible Church. And we became members here at the church. Now, fast forward, I'm now graduated from high school. I'm probably 18, 19 years old, going to college, and I started going to women's Bible study. And I remember a teaching that a woman did on the righteousness of God. It was the first time I'd ever heard it. And I was amazed at the revelation. I I still couldn't even wrap my mind, because little by little, we're going to take this territory. I couldn't, I understood it, but I didn't understand it. Does that make sense? And so it, the understanding needed to be a part of my speech. It needed to be a part of my heart. It needed to be a part of my spirit. It needed to be a part of my, my daily walk in my life. It was, a re, it was knowledge. It was becoming a revelation, but it wasn't there yet. Does that make sense? And so I would have battles. I would say to myself, well, I'm not getting that breakthrough because, well, I'm not worthy. I'm not getting that answer to my prayer because, well... <laughs> Wasn't in my Bible much this week. I don't even know if I listened to a Christian song this whole week. I would say these things to myself. Well, I wasn't saying it. It was the accuser. It was the enemy. He comes to us, and he says these things, right? So now, years later, I'm married. I'm probably 23, 24, have two children. And there was this one day... Me and Jason got in a massive fight right before he went to work. Oh, he, we just got in this big, huge fight. And side note, he can make me really mad. <laughs> and so I've come to learn that it's not me, but it is this husband that he gave me. <laughs> so <laughs> that was just a side note. Let's get back. We got in a huge fight, massive fight. And my daughter, Katie, she's a little infant, and she was running a fever that day. And I remember she was in her crib, and I went in to take care of her, to pray over her, and the enemy was there in my thoughts. Who do you think you are? How do you think you have any right to pray over her? You've been fighting with your husband. The things that you said, the things he said, what do you think? You think you have authority right now to pray over her? And in that moment, I had a vision of Jesus. And he came and he stood right in front of me. And he spoke to that enemy and he said, she belongs to me. And this is what I want us all to do right now. If the enemy comes at you and he says those things the way he said them to me, I want you to see Jesus coming and standing right in front of you right now. And he's saying to the enemy, he belongs to me. She belongs to me. Amen. And I got a revelation that I have been completely, I had a revelation that Jesus has bore all my sins, that I have been completely forgiven. This is what it says here in 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he made him who Jesus, this is what we're talking about Jesus, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So this makes so much more sense. So now I can boldly approach the throne of grace and obtain mercy and find grace in any time of need because I am 
the righteousness of God. If the enemy is coming at you tonight, if the enemy is coming at you this week, you can boldly say to him, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I can take that mercy. I can get that grace. And I'm going to get my help in my time of need because I live in Jesus and he moves through me. Amen. In fact, it says he doesn't even remember your sins. Isaiah 43 says this in verse 25. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my sake, and I will remember your sins no more. God says this, that he blots out. How does he blot that out? He blotted it out with the blood of Jesus. You know, I was um, talking to Dr. Tom a couple weeks ago, and we got in this conversation about the power of the cross. And he said to me, he goes, you know that in normal crucifixions back in that time, they would have taken ropes and tied the hands and tied the feet to the cross, but not with Jesus. With Jesus, they pierced his hands and they pierced his feet so that the blood, so all the blood in his body would be drained out every ounce. So we're talking about the, the, the crown of thorns, the stripes on his back, the, the piercing of his side and his hands and his feet. So all that his blood would be poured out for the remission of of our sins. It says this in Matthew 6, 26, 28, for this is the blood that seals the new covenant and it will be poured out for many for the complete forgiveness of sins. An ounce of his blood has completely wiped away anything that you have done, anything that you will do, Everything, it blots it all out and he can not even recall what you have done. You'll recall it. The enemy will try to recall it for you, but it does not, it does not separate you from God's love, from God's abundance, from anything that God would want to bless you with in your life. There's nothing that can block that anymore because of the precious blood of Jesus. Amen? Let's talk about the woman caught in adultery. In John in chapter 8, it's such a great story to bring home this point tonight. The Pharisees had caught this woman in the very act of adultery. That's what the Bible says. So if you're going to imagine this, like they were hanging out by her house, waiting for her to have adultery, and they grabbed her. Okay? This is how I take it. And they bring her in front of Jesus. See, they brought him, her to Jesus, and they explained to Jesus in this moment... This woman has been caught in the very act of adultery. What should we do with him? This is what the law says to do. And they weren't wrong. That is what the law said to do. It was the law. And Jesus, in that moment, he stoops down and he begins to write in the sand. We all know this story. And they thought that he was ignoring them. So they came at him even more and they said, what do we do with her? She was caught in the act of adultery. And Jesus stands up in that moment and he says to them, he who is out sin among you, cast that first stone. And then he stooped down again. I never realized he stooped down two times, but he stooped down again. And I was really meditating on this because the first time that we see that the hand of God wrote something in the Bible was the Ten Commandments. And here now was the very hand of God writing something again. And I believe that he was writing out forgiven. <laughs> one by one, those men left. And he stands up and he says to the woman, where are your accusers now? And she's like, there's, not, there's none. And he goes, neither do I condemn you. I don't accuse you either. 
see, that is exactly the scenario we all go through. The accuser wants to come. He wants to take that very thing. He wants to put it right in front of you and say, look what you've done. But Jesus steps in in that moment and says, I don't know what you're talking about. I love her. I love him completely as they are. I want to bless them. I want to heal them. I want to anoint them. I want to give them power in this world. Amen. E.W. Kenyon, he was a, a pastor and an evangelist in the 18, 1900s. And um, if you want to learn more about the righteousness, man, this man knew about the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He never wrote a book. These are all sermons that you can read of his that his children, when he passed, his, passed away, his children compiled his sermons. And this, that's how you can read the books that are out there. It says, to most of us, hopefully they put it up there for you, to most of us, what we were before we found Christ so dominates our minds, so rules us that we forget what we are now in him. Let this not be us tonight. We belittle our redemption and we magnify our failures. Our weakness is ever with us. We have forgotten that he is ever with us. If we would persistently fix our thoughts upon what we are in Christ and what Christ is doing for us at the right hand of the Father, it would lift us out of weakness and failure into his strength. Set your mind on the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Praise God, if we would persistently fix our eyes upon what we are in Christ Jesus. You know, this is the message of the cross. I've been really passionate about the message of the cross and just really fixing my thoughts on what he accomplished on the cross for me. And you know, as you go into the word and as you read the word or listen to the word, now that we, can, we have apps that we can listen to the word, he becomes so alive in every scripture. And as, that, as he becomes more alive and more revelation to you, you find out how, how you have power on this word, uh, how you can be an overcomer on this earth. This is just Jesus revealing himself. This is the message. Of, this is the power of God happening in your life. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says this, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the very power of God. It is the very power of God, that message that you hear from the word of God, that you are established in his righteousness, that you can stand on his faithfulness, that you can be free from fear. You can be free from terror and oppression, that God has greatness for you. That he has given you abilities on this word. He has a massive destiny in your life planned just for you. You can't allow the enemy and his accusations to take you off that, but center yourself and get yourself grounded in Jesus and know that he is for you, that nothing can come against you because he is for you. So I want to pray tonight. I want to pray for people who have been dealing with those thoughts that have come from the enemy. He's told you you're not worthy. He's told you that you don't measure up. He's told you that you haven't done enough. And I'm here to tell you tonight, that's not true. You're not more righteous. You're not righteous because you've done everything right. You're righteous because Jesus did everything right. In the name of Jesus, Lord, I just come before you right now. Wash. Holy Spirit, wash those words. Wash those words off their minds and out of their hearts now in the name of Jesus. By the blood of Jesus, they have been redeemed. They have been set free. I thank you, Lord, that we can stand on your faithfulness, that you faithfully went to the cross for us. And so wash us clean, clean of those accusing thoughts now. Take those accusations out of their hearts and minds. Have them be uprooted from their life. It will not be a part of your life anymore. 
in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father God. And now with everyone just closing in their eyes, I want to take a moment. You came here tonight, and you had no idea that this pastor girl was going to teach on being righteous. And I'm speaking this message to you tonight. You never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And there are people here tonight, the Holy Spirit is telling me right now, that want to rededicate their life. Every eye is closed in this room. If that is you tonight, I just want you to boldly raise your hand right now. You want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Put your hand up right now. Thank you, Lord. Boldly do it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I see that hand. I see that hand. Yes. We say this prayer all together. Dear Heavenly Father, forgive me of all my sins. And I ask you, dear Jesus, to come into my life, come into my heart, be my Lord and my Savior. Baptize me in your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.